Right, let's get things underway and welcome on stage for the Fireside Chat, Head of BT Sport, Jamie Hindhoff. Hi, so here you yeah. Good morning, Jamie. Thank you so much for being with us in the home of BT Sports Studio. Yeah, it was a long journey. Yeah, I can I tell downstairs. the commute was difficult, wasn't it? <laughs> um, we've seen a lot of big changes across sport production mm. in the last 12 to 18 months. You know, everybody's talking about 5G, cloud-based production, augmented reality, the gamification of sport, more publishing con uh, options for content, etc. I, I could go on. But what for you have been the key trends, do you think, of 2022? Well, I, I think, firstly, good morning, everyone. Sorry. Um, I think you've just listed them, but I put them all under one word, which is about flexibility. So I think what we're seeing is the opportunity to do things in multiple different ways that you can then uh, adopt for the circumstances you're working in. Um, and I think it's really, really interesting. I think there are a lot of buzzwords uh, going on. We talk about 5G and network slicing, which I think is still some way off. But then you look at private networks of 5G that we've used effectively. Uh, and you can see the benefit that brings of untethering cameras, for instance. The XR stuff's really interesting, um, but from that is creating the content. Uh, everyone always talks about immersive, et cetera, et cetera, but I think there's a real danger that you start creating content because you can. Uh, and I think it's looking at how you use these tools to unlock opportunity that audiences want. But I think it's been a huge revolution going on around the traditional, I call it pre-COVID, ways of capturing content to where we are now. And it's, it's adopting that flexibility. But I also think you have to look at it really carefully uh, about how you do it. And there's always a danger in our industry. And we go through these cycles where it's engineering and technology that's trying to drive editorial rather than the content storytelling, uh, us standing up and saying, these are the tools we need to be able to do this but at the same time, understanding what the technology capability brings to enable us to do that. Well, I know that BT Sport's been making very good progress with things like cloud production. Mm. And I think, in fact, we can show you now one example. It was a UEFA Youth League match mm -hmm. that was played just last month. Uh, I think we can roll the video now. Four, three, two, one. So traditional coverage of a UEFA Youth League game would involve us sending lots of infrastructure to the ground where the match is being played. So, for example, we send um, a match scanner or an outside broadcast truck. We send uh, an articulated uh, tender vehicle with all the cameras and cables and tripods and microphones, a very large heavy generator and a satellite linked vehicle. And there we would produce a six camera world feed that we then send via satellite around the world to UEFA World Feed partners, but also to ourselves in Stratford, where we would normally then add graphics and commentary for our own channel. In this new model, we are doing away with nearly all that infrastructure and just retaining the cameras and microphones, but now taking the output of those into cloud encoders. This is using 5G or 4G or fixed line internet to connect into the public cloud where we're running a completely virtualized production center. So in that production center, we are vision mixing, we are sound mixing, we're adding graphics, we're running in replays, and we're adding commentary. And only at the very end do we bring those signals back out of the cloud for distribution, either the world feed to UEFA's world feed partners or to our playout center to broadcast onto our channel. We've done previous trials such as the IBC uh, cloud accelerator where we saw that uh, this sort of cloud production technique can reduce the carbon footprint of a, of a traditional gallery by up to 70 percent but this model takes it a lot further because that was just the gallery this time we're doing away with all that on-prem infrastructure all those big heavy trucks all those people traveling to site so we expect the reductions to be much much greater BT Sports Live, Premier League, Champions League and Premiership Rugby broadcasts already BAFTA Albert certified productions, so they meet some of the highest sustainability standards globally. We're aiming for all BT Sport produced live, football, rugby, boxing, documentaries to meet the same standards over 2022 and beyond. And really key to these trials is to reflect on the trials uh, and, and understand what we can learn uh, before making any decisions. All of that said, the potential benefits are clear. It allows us to focus freed up resource on content, enhances our sustainability footprint and supports our people in terms of work-life balance and diversity, which obviously is better for our people and really importantly for our audiences who are engaging with this content. I should talk more about um, UEFA and our relationship with UEFA. 
Um, I'm so proud of the relationship we've built and I know it's mutual. Um, since 2015, we have been pioneering new ways of engaging and taking people to the heart of sport. And moving to the cloud is another really big opportunity and you can't do this without the support of your partners. So uh, as always with our relationship with UEFA, I'm extremely grateful and really proud that for the first time, we at BT Sport will be doing a cloud production around a live UEFA game um, in conjunction with them and with their support. So it's fantastic for all of us. So I think that happened, what, in October, didn't it? Yeah. Just last month. It did, yes. How did it go? How was the trial? What um, were your takeaways? It went phenomenally successful. I mean, it wasn't just a closed trial. That um, world feed went out to all of the UEFA partners broadcasting that. Um, it's really, really interesting exercise. And um, you can definitely see the potential. And, and I highlighted the stuff in there, you know, around uh, inclusion and an opportunity for all people to be involved in the work. I think sustainability is obviously a key thing for all of us. It's so important um, to try and improve on that. Um, but I also think, you, you know, we're not going to rush into this. Um, we shouldn't rush into it. For me, it's very much like we weren't fully remote. It, it's looking at what the options are, but also taking away the learnings. And the one thing I think we have to be really careful of is the beauty of cloud is you can do it anywhere. Um, so you can have your production team all in a virtual gallery or you can have them all across the UK, which has many benefits, but it's the word team I think we need to focus on. And, and there's a real danger, if we're not careful, that we're creating new capabilities where people no longer work as a team and learn from each other other disciplines. Um, so, you know, for our remote, for instance, we work on an 80-20 split. We could do 100, um, but we do an 80-20 because it's important for teams to be on site. It's important for teams to work together. Um, the industry is short uh, of people coming into it uh, and learning new skills, you've got to be together. So I think, I think it's really exciting. Uh, I think the financial benefit and the sustainability benefit really interesting. You've just got to be really clever how you use it. I, I was going to say, how do you get that balance then? Well, Between moving forward but keeping that team I, element? I think you address it full on. It's like I said very clearly, you know, it, it would have been very compelling for us to stand up and say we're 100% remote. Hmm. Um, you know, it knocks about 50% off of our um, emissions when we're doing it remote from here or from High Wycombe. But then we made a conscious decision. We talked to our teams and you start to see um, people are not quite as match fit or, or the cross discipline isn't quite the same. So, so we rolled that back slightly and I think it's just hitting it head on, but also talking to people who are in these editorial positions who, who traditionally sit in trucks and making sure we listen to get that balance right. What are your thoughts then wider? I guess, really, on the changing shape of sports broadcasting, sports streaming, as we know, is continuing to grow at a pace. We're seeing more clubs and federations producing and sending out their own content direct to consumers, uh, linear TV coverage vying with social platforms to get a fan's attention. How do you see things? Um, so I've been on record before. I don't like the term OTT. Um, it's just a mechanism of delivering content. Um, your broadcaster, how you get the content into the screen for me is irrelevant. I think it creates great opportunity, especially personally around localization and personalization. There's, there's so much you can do in IP that you can't do in the one to many, uh, which I think is interesting. Um, it's a very complex market, isn't it? Because for instance, you know, we produce the Premier League coverage along with Sunset and Vine for the Amazon Premier League deal. Um, they are also competing with us for rights. Yeah. So, so it is quite a, a hybrid thing. Um, Really interesting. I'm glad to see that on the panel later. I was at Man City yesterday, uh, so I had a sneak preview of what you're going to see. Um, and it's fantastic. And, and what I love, actually, is, is people would say, you know, is that bastardising your content? Is it taking you away? And I actually think it's the other way, because the more content that is produced that gets to audiences, the greater awareness of where to watch the key live games, which is our USP, is the live, the live games is really important. And, and if, I hope you're staying for that panel because I was really impressed, but I went in and had a good look around, a poke around. I, li <laughs> I like looking in the studio and uh, really impressive what they're doing. And, and for me, part of me being there actually was looking at how, how we work together more, you, you know, because creating great content is what we should all be doing. Um, so I think um, that's from my own social. Social is a really interesting one, isn't it? I mean, we've embraced social, you know, the Champions League final goes out on YouTube. We do things like no filter. I think the question from me is, is more about 
understanding the value of what you give away for free, what you use it for as regards brand awareness, but also how you encourage people into your, into your platforms, into your environment. Um, but it's definitely got a need and it's definitely it's one of our USPs. It, it's certainly driven awareness of BT Sport in a very different way. Obviously, I'm sure many people in this uh, room, <laughs> don't, don't smile, <laughs> are going <laughs> to no want to know a little bit more about BT Sports joint venture with Warner Brothers Discovery. Yes. What can you tell us about it <laughs> and what can fans expect? Well, I can tell you I've left BT, <laughs> um, which um, everyone always asks what I'm doing next, which does piss me off a little bit. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, so I mean, it's, it, it's been out there. It's been one heck of a journey. Um, me, my whole team now uh, work for Warner Brothers Discovery, so, so we do still deliver BT Sport, but we are now working for them. It's been a fantastic transition. Um, it's brilliant moving into a business that is purely content, and that's no disrespect from where we were, but the opportunities for us and looking at the entertainment portfolio that they have is fantastic. And um, it's really exciting. And I think the key thing here is, is people understanding what this really does bring longer term. So the, the JV that everyone talks about is around the rights and, and sitting within that central pot now is all of Eurosports content and all of BT Sports content. Um, for the current period, we'll stay separate. So BT Sport will carry on as BT Sport, um, delivering the content and the rights that we have. Eurosport will carry on. But longer term, there is an, obviously an opportunity to bring um, a new brand, um, bring that content together. Um, which from an audience perspective should be really exciting because there's some great set of rights there and when you bring them together um, it, will, it will be really compelling and not to lose sight as well you know that the entertainment offering that will sit alongside that and I, and I think when you look at premium sport premium entertainment it's a really compelling offer so you know we are in it for the long haul um, the transition as I say has been great we're enjoying ourselves um, we're getting a huge amount of support to continue delivering the great stuff we're doing, but being involved in something which already has a 10-year uh, a agreement with Sky in place for our longevity is fantastic, and it's, it's something that I think the whole team are embracing. So, but first and foremost, for the audience perspective, it's going to be really great. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to seeing what happens over the next 12 yes. months or so. Um, lots of meetings, I can imagine. Well, there's, a few. <laughs> there's a few. All right, we are out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation Thank for you. Jamie Hinder. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.